All right, let's get started. Um, welcome to that three, four, five. Day three of reInvent, really exciting, so many new launches. And guess what? Whenever I talk to customers, they tell me, hey, can you help me catch up to all the things you have la launched in the recent times? And how those things can make it easier and simpler for me to run my databases so that I can do more with less. And that's the theme of the times nowadays, right? People want to do more with less at a lower cost. So that's precisely what I'm going to answer for you guys in this session. I'm going to talk about the new capabilities and features we have launched on RDS for Oracle and SQL Server, including both the RDS and RDS custom services. My name is Cheyenne Biswas. I lead the product team for, that is responsible for RDS for Oracle, SQL Server. There's one more engine, we'll get into it. But before I move forward, I wanted to get a sense of the room. I spoke to a few of you, but how many of you, by a raise of hands, are using RDS today? That's what I like to see, almost all of you. All right, perfect. How about Oracle? How many of, uh, how many of you are Oracle users? Quite a few. SQL Server? Oh, all right. Now this is the new one, uh, DB2. Uh, okay, I see a few hands, okay, okay, that's perfect. So I also saw some puzzle looks. Um, that's right, we launched RDS for DB2. It is now an engine offered on RDS as a fully managed service, of course. We'll manage uh, you know, setting up, operating, scaling your DB2 databases as well. And this is something based on, of course, what we heard from customers. Um, so what's on agenda today? Looks like most of you already use RDS, so I'll do a quick primer of um, RDS and RDS custom. And after that, we are going to focus on uh, last one, one and a half years worth of launches and dive deeper into a few specific key launches. There's so many that I can keep talking for a week, but we only have an hour. So I'm going to focus on the key ones that customers told us they are most excited about and are able to get the most value out of. Um, as we go along, I will also sprinkle in some best practices. This is, again, based on the conversations we have with customers, things that they wanted to know beforehand, and so it will help you, hopefully, as you go on your uh, journey with RDS. So first off, like why managed services? You guys are already using RDS. The key value prop here is that, you know, as we were uh, running Amazon.com databases, like some of the largest, most intense workloads, we realized that running production databases, critical databases, is cumbersome. It requires a lot of effort, it, requires quite, it incurs quite a bit of cost. And therefore, we wanted to take our learnings and make it easier for you to operate databases. So you don't have to do um, undifferentiated database administrative work. It involves installing uh, database uh, software, applying patches, taking backups, doing um, uh, cross-region disaster recovery or high availability within, uh, within uh, a region as well. That takes quite a bit of effort. So with managed services, you can offload all of that undifferentiated work to AWS. We take care of that. The other piece is customers also recognize cost savings through it. So when we think about um, RDS, we give you the ability to scale up and down your instance with a few clicks. And that makes it easier for you to adjust the infrastructure based on your application's needs. We, again, I'm talking about the broader portfolio of services right now as well. So we have also Amazon Aurora, where we offer serverless, Neptune, Elasticash, so on and so forth. So again, that gives you optimization capabilities. And when we talk about RDS Oracle, SQL Server, um, we have license included options. So you only pay for the license for as long as you are using the database instance too. So that helps you reduce costs. And finally, it frees you up for um, you know, focusing on things that matter to your end customers. So you no longer have to worry about you know, patching a database. How many times have you guys enjoyed applying a patch? I never say, uh, hear from any DBA who said like, you know what, I loved applying patches to my database. So you don't have to do that anymore. We take care of that. So you can focus on what matters to your application developers, to your end customers. So optimizing the database, building more optimal uh, database schemas and so forth. With Amazon RDS, as the name suggests, 
relational database service. It is a managed database service for relational databases. We now have a portfolio of eight relational databases. So we have Aurora and MySQL and Postgres compatible editions. We have open source database engines, MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres, and commercial database engines that would include DB2 now, Oracle, and SQL Server. Uh, RDS, for those of you who don't know, was launched in 2009. It is one of the first services to launch on AWS. So with that, we have 14 years of operational experience operating hundreds of thousands of databases. And that, in turn, translates to better practices, hardened security, better automation, so that you have an easier path with managing and running your databases on AWS. High availability, again, out of the box. You can click a button on our console. It's a quick API call. And we automatically deploy your database across availability zones so that if something goes wrong, we also automate and fail over to your standby instance. And as I was mentioning before, we make it easier for you to also scale your databases. So it's a click button operation to go to a larger instance if you want to do that. Um, RDS commercial engines is a subset, as I was describing before, we have eight engines, the subset of engines which require licenses. That includes DB2, Oracle, and SQL Server. You get all the benefits of RDS. In addition, you get license flexibility. So for RDS, Oracle, and SQL Server, we offer license-included options. You also have option to bring your own licenses, BYOL. If you have existing licenses with any of these vendors, you can bring them over through certain choices. We'll get into some of those details later. And then it's about ease of migration. Oftentimes, customers tell us that, hey, I have this Oracle database running on-premises. I want to modernize it, but I want to do it easily. So yes, without any schema, uh, any schema change, it is running the same Oracle binaries, SQL Server binaries. You can move over to RDS. Um, just a quick overview of what I described. You have the Aurora engines, you have the open source engines. In this session, we are going to focus on the commercial engines. So that's going to include RDS for DB2, Oracle, and SQL Server. RDS for DB2 is what I'm going to start with because we are really excited. We collaborated closely with IBM for making this launch happen. It was announced just a few days back, a couple of days back on Monday. So it's generally available. You can just go on to the console right now and provision a DB2 instance if you want to. Uh, migrating from existing DB2 databases is simple, whether you're running on-premises or whether you're self-managing DB2 instances. Uh, you can use native tooling available with IBM DB2, or you can use Amazon Database Migration Service. Again, this is a new capability that was launched on Amazon DMS, where then DB2 is now supported both as a source and a destination. The version we support on RDS is 11.5.9. So that's the version that's available to you. As I said, you can bring your own licenses. So if you have existing licenses, which obviously if you're running a DB2 uh, database, you would have it. We give you the capability to just you know, bring in your license information and run your databases on RDS. And uh, on DB2, we also support Oracle compatibility mode. It's a feature of DB2 that you can enable. It is supported on RDS. I'm only going to briefly touch upon that. There's a deeper dive session, what's in sessions on uh, RDS for DB2. It happened earlier this morning. If you missed it, if you're interested in it, you can watch the recording. It is DAT210, should be available um, online in a few days. Uh, so then let's move over to the key launches that we had for the last year or so. And this is, again, as I said, based on what customers told us they like most and are able to use, um, uh, use it more effectively for, um, first of all, migrating their databases, right? So in, in your journey moving to the cloud, first step is, of course, migrating your, migrating your existing databases. So I'm going to cover one feature there, which is Recovery Manager RMAN, Transportable Table Spaces, and dive deeper into it. We'll talk about a few manageability capabilities that we have expanded, so it makes it easier and simpler for you uh, to then operate your databases. Move on to how you maintain visibility within your database. So once you have your database up and running on RDS, what are the capabilities, new features we have added to help you continue to maintain visibility with what's going on within the database? 
And then we'll conclude with, of course, we are all about choices. We have added the choice of 3B2. It's also about newer versions. So SQL Server 2022 is something that we announced support for recently. So that's also something we'll quickly cover. So let's giddy up and get into migrations. So migrations, is, as I said, is usually the first step that you take for migrating your database from on-premises, wherever else you are running it, to, um, to RDS. And one of the key features we have landed there is Recovery Manager, RMAN. It is the native backup and recovery tooling available on Oracle for transportable table spaces. Now, the neat thing about RMAN transportable table spaces, also abbreviated to XTTS, is that it is a physical backup. So it is representing how your data is going to be stored on disk physically. So what that entails is that it's easier for you than to maintain data consistency. With logical backups, when you're loading and unloading data, there's a possibility that errors uh, occur and therefore you may lose consistency in your database. With physical data uh, backups, that goes away. Um, the other piece is it is fully integrated with both the parts we support for migration. So there are two integration parts. One is through S3, you can you know, dump your backup files. The other one is EFS. I'm going to touch upon it uh, in, in a quick bit. EFS is Elastic File System, and RDS Oracle is integrated with EFS so that you can mount the same file system on your source database, maybe running on-premises, and destination database on RDS. So that cuts short the number of steps you have to take to move your data over to RDS. Uh, it is available for the enterprise edition of Oracle as a feature of Oracle Enterprise Edition. The other piece that we hear from customers that's really interesting about RMAN XTTS is that it helps you convert NDNS. So you could be running on, let's say, a Solaris operating system, which is big NDN, and then on Linux, you need to convert to little Indian. And with our man, transportable table spaces, Oracle supports that capability. It will convert from big Indian to in, uh, little Indian for you. So let's first look at what are the migration paths available to you when it comes to RDS for Oracle. So you have the source database. There's the logical export path, which existed prior to us doing our man extra TS. So you would set up network connectivity between your source uh, and destination database. Then you would take a backup through data pump. You would move those dump files onto an S3 bucket, then read those dump files onto an RDS Oracle instance and restore them. So this is a multi-step process. With the Elastic File System integration, these additional steps go away. You straight away dump your files onto the file system and read it from the destination Oracle instance and restore it directly. So that already improved the experience, but this was all, again, logical replication. With physical replication using our man transportable table spaces, we work on top of EFS. So it's still going to work with the Elastic File System integration. And the way it's going to work is that first you will take, take an RMAN XTTS level zero backup. Now, what is an RMAN XTTS level zero backup? Essentially, it's a table space, and a table space in Oracle, for those who are unaware, is essentially your data files, indexes, and such. So that backup will move your data over onto the destination. Beyond that, your uh, source database, of course, is continuing to take reads and writes. So as the writes happen, database ch uh, data changes, so you will take incremental backups. So those incremental backups, again, you're writing straight onto the EFS, gets getting read on the RDS Oracle side and restored. So you keep rolling forward your RDS Oracle database. Eventually, you reach a point there where both the databases are almost at parity. At that point, what you would want to do is quiesce the source uh, database and take a data pump metadata backup. This would include stuff like stored procedures, users, and because this is relatively light data, it gets restored on the source uh, destination side, RDS for Oracle database instance, rather quickly. And that's it. 
Once that happens, you cut over and your RDS4 Oracle database is ready for reads and writes for you. Next up on the manageability front, we'll move into Oracle multi-tenant. Now, Oracle multi-tenant is a capability that allows you to consolidate multiple databases into one database instance. And the way we have integrated with Oracle multi-tenant is that we treat these multi-tenant databases, which Oracle calls pluggable databases, and the underlying database instance, it runs on what they call as container database or CDB. We treat these PDBs just like any other top-level entity. So you get access to full CRUD APIs. You can create, you can describe, you can delete and modify these PDBs just like any other database instance. So what's the benefit you get out of it? The benefit is you can use uh, you know, services such as CloudFormation or Terraform for provisioning and managing your um, uh, PDBs just like database instances. Uh, it is offered for both the license included model as well as BYOL, it's available to you. It's also available on both standard ed edition two and enterprise edition. Um, so as we spoke to customers, this was something they found really interesting. And I'm highlighting two use cases where customers um, uh, you know, really found that multi-tenant databases are going to be helpful for them and they have employed them. Uh, first thing is, of course, they want to improve utilization. So if you consolidate multiple workloads into one database instance, you are now in a position, if they are complementary, you are able to better use the resources on the database instance. Uh, databases typically, by the way, are provisioned for peak, but they're not always running at peak. Like business hours, usually you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 hours. Beyond that, it quiets down, so you don't get as much utility. So first model where we saw customers found utility here was with follow the sun operations. You are an international business, you are running out of Asia Pacific, you are running out of Europe, you are running out of Americas. Your database workload shifts over the day. And so what you can do, and you still have separate databases for each of these geos. What you can do is you can consolidate them in one CDB, container database, which is eventually a database instance, and as these peaks shift, I'm showing in this graphic, you're able to improve the utilization of your database instance, that is the infrastructure underneath. The other use case, which is also very commonly used for uh, PDBs and CDBs, is CI-CD pipelines, continuous integration and deployment pipelines. Uh, so you have a depth test environment, then you have a QA environment and a pre-prod environment. You switch from uh, you know, depth test to QA to prod as your pipeline progresses. So your utilization for these three separate databases also you know, move along that. But that's not optimal util utilization of your database instance. If you consolidate all of them in one database instance instead, you can save on infrastructure costs. The other great thing about this is that managing or configuring the database instance with your application is also simpler because now you have to set up network connectivity only once between your application and database instance. And beyond that, it is just a matter of switching the synonym, pointing to the specific PDB on the connection string. So I have a demo here, which I'm going to walk through how easy it is to set up a PDB on, on RDS for Oracle. So let's hop on over to uh, the RDS console. And we'll, we'll hit databases. I already have a container database created with two databases in there, dev and QA. I'm going to now set up a pre-prod PDB on it. So in the actions, select add tenant database, give it a nice name, which is pre-prod in this case. I'm going to uh, sit with the defaults here in terms of um, the username and then insert, uh, provide the password, and that's it. In a few minutes, it gets created. We take a backup. Once the backup's taken, it is fully operational and running. So again, as I said, this is super simple. I did it through the console. You can also do it with CloudFormation templates. So you can set it up with a CloudFormation template and run it. Now, one thing I'm going to simulate here is how you can run benchmarks, for example, we have heard from customers. They want to run it with CI CD pipelines. So this is the TNS Aura configuration. It is setting the connection string 
for the three databases we looked at. And now I'm using HammerDB for just again to you know, simulate what's going on here. And the only change you would see in the HammerDB script is that we have to change the instance synonym, which was dev in this case. I run this and then go over to see the CPU utilization on that instance. Of course, it spikes. Now, of course, we are simul simulating this, so let's assume that we have moved the pipeline over uh, to uh, QA. So now, what I did is switched the connection string to the QA environment, but of course, it's running on the same database instance, so you see the CPU spiking up again. And the last step, of course, is pre-prod. So pre-prod, we run the benchmark, we ensure that there are no uh, regressions in this case. You get this nice little three curves that I was showing as a graphic in the previous slide. So this is what you can achieve by improving, and it allows you to then improve the utilization of database instance, instance of having to provision three separate database instances which only get utilized for a short time frame. Um, Moving on and switching gears to SQL Server, I saw there were a lot of folks who are also running SQL Server databases. So one new capability that we have added is support for self-managed Active Directory authentication. So as we talked to customers, they many times told us that there are two situations where they want to use self-managed Active Directory for authentication as they use their RDS for SQL Server databases. First one was when they are in the pro process of migrating to AWS. And so they are going to take um, you know, multiple steps in that migration journey, and usually Active Directory is towards the back end of this migration. So they want to move the Active Directory first. So during that transition phase, they want to still be able to use Active Directory for authentication. The other one is when customers have uh, either internal mandates or compliance requirements because of which they need to maintain granular control over their Active Directory system. So in those both cases, now you have the flexibility to join your SQL Server database instance to an Active Directory domain. Now, we have done a few additional things to make this process simpler for you. First one is in the process of setting up Active Directory authentication, you have to create an organizational unit and a service account. The service account is used by RDS to be able to authenticate with your Active Directory setup. We have a script that we have provided which simplifies all of this. You see it up on the screen. You can download it with the QR code that I have there. All you have to provide is, a, uh, is the DNS name, the OU name, then the service account name, and password. And that's it. It will create the Active Directory setup for you. Step two is creating a KMS key. Key management service, KMS key, would be used for encrypting the password of the service account that we created in step one. So we create that quick steps on the console. One thing to note here is that you would want to apply a policy, resource policy, to the KMS key, ensuring that the service principal, rds.amazon.com, gets access to that key for decrypting your credentials, of course. Uh, third step is moving the credentials onto Secrets Manager. You don't want to keep it in open text. We don't want to do that either. Security is job zero for us. Secrets Manager securely stores your service user ID and password. And uh, as you would notice here, of course, you have to also grant access to RDS to be able to access this secret. So that's the resource policy you see for that. And the final step then is to, come in, uh, is to come on to RDS SQL Server. Here you would want to select SQL Server Authentication, Windows Authentication. And once you do that, uh, you can opt for, as you see, we previously had AWS Active, Managed Active Directory Service Integration. You now will see the option on the screen to also connect with the self-managed Active Directory. And then you just specify a few details to point to your Active Directory, which would be the domain name service username, um, and then the secret on, and finally, the DNS uh, resolvers for your Active Directory. That's it. With that, you would be set up for self-managed Active Directory Windows authentication. Moving on to, of course, now we talked about migration. We talked about uh, running your databases on, uh, on RDS. Uh, customers also tell us that, how do I maintain deeper visibility into what's going on in my database? 
So for that, on SQL Server side, we added support. It's already supported on RDS for Oracle. On SQL Server, we added support for database activity streams. This capability is continuously in near real time pushing out audit activities. So for example, failed logins, login activity in general, onto Kinesis data streams. From Kinesis data streams, you have the flexibility to use a bunch of other services. So you can either push it to S3 for a data lake integration, you can use Redshift for data warehousing, you can move it to open search if you want to you know, run queries on top of uh, the audit data that you are seeing. Or you can pick a third party solution that you use for monitoring and integrate with it. Uh, it is something that we have seen customers use for continuously. Of course, one of the scenarios I'm talking about is audit activity, which is you know, login activity that's going on in your database. So suddenly, if you see some you know, failed logins popping up, and quite a few of them, you can imagine maybe someone is trying to break in. So those are the uh, situations where customers are using this capability. It underneath, of course, relies on SQL Server's audit capability. So if that's something you are used to, you, this is based on that. So that's what we are using here. The other key feature we added is with RDS Performance Insights integration for SQL level metrics. So RDS Performance Insights, uh, we have designed uh, this, you know, it's a feature of RDS. It is intended to allow non-experts to quickly diagnose performance problems with your database and, uh, and solve them. So what you see on the screenshot here is um, essentially a bunch of queries that are consuming, you know, top, uh, top queries that are consuming resources on my database. And in this example, uh, I have two queries that are returning more than 7,000, close to 8,000 rows being processed. And that's the new capability we have added, the SQL level metrics, which is how many rows are being processed, uh, what is the average latency per query, and how many calls per query are we making? So this, in turn, of course, going back to my example, what it let me uh, uh, understand quickly was that these two queries are probably not written properly. I can then click through it. It will tell me exactly what the query uh, SQL construct was. And what I realized was that I was missing some predicates. And as a result, pulling a bunch of data. Just went in, fixed it, just snap and easy like that. Uh, moving on to choices, um, we recently added support for RD, uh, SQL Server 2022 on RDS. Um, we spent quite a bit of time making sure that the build was stable, so we tested it thoroughly with the initial builds. Eventually, it got to a place where we felt comfortable that it was ready for production usage by our customers. That's why we added uh, SQL Server 2022. Bunch of features there. I'm not going to get into details of each one of these. Microsoft has um, their documentation, and then uh, you can refer those things. But just a quick highlight, uh, there's a SQL ledger capability. So it's an immutable database capability that you can now run within SQL Server. And a lot of performance improvements. So buffer pool, parallel scans, query store hands, um, bunch of other things that Microsoft have impro has improved in terms of you know, performance on SQL Server 2022. So that wraps up our RDS for Oracle and RDS for SQL Server segment. Next, I'm going to move on to RDS Custom. Just a quick show of hands again. Uh, how many of you have heard about RDS Custom? That's great. Again, more than 50% of the room. How many of you are using RDS Custom? All right, a few of you. OK, so for those of you who are not aware what RDS Custom is, it provides the same management capabilities as RDS, but at the same time, it is intended for situations where you need elevated database and operating system level access. With Amazon RDS, the database instance is managed fully by us. So you can't access the operating system, and get super user privileges. With RDS Custom, all the resources get deployed in your account, in your VPC. So you have full visibility into those resources. You can access them as if they were your own EC2 instances. So that's also a shared responsibility model. 
because there's enough rope that something could go wrong. So something to be mindful of from that perspective. But going back to the use cases, why customers wanted this and why we built it for customers was, first of all, they wanted to be able to use it for you know, traditional applications, custom applications. Let's say you have Oracle eBusiness Suite, or you want to run SharePoint on SQL Server, or uh, you, know, you have a custom application that a vendor built with you know, assumptions of elevated access. But that vendor is no longer around, so you can't change the database software. This gives you the option to run on a managed service while getting the benefit of uh, being able to get elevated access to your database. So again, uh, fitting back into all the choices we have available, we have Amazon RDS, which is a fully managed service. RDS Custom is where you get elevated access to your database and operating system. More flexibility also in terms of, you know, let's say, the database drivers or specific patches that you want to run. And RDS on Outpost is for very specific scenarios wherein you want to continue running on-premises, Outpost um, being the hardware. I'm not going to touch upon hard, uh, Outpost today. Let's move on to RDS Custom in the interest of time and where we are seeing customers use uh, Custom. So first is license flexibility. With SQL Server, one of the conversations we often hear is I already have licenses. How do I bring them over? So RDS Custom for SQL Server gives you the ability of bringing your own license with your own media. So you'll download your own SQL Server installables. You will provide the media to us, including, including the license information, and then you can run with the, within the scope of a managed service uh, through RDS Custom for SQL Server. With Oracle, of course, uh, just so you know, on RDS Oracle, you do have the flexibility to bring your own license. So if that's the only use case, you don't necessarily have to get to RDS Custom for Oracle. But there are other situations, situations where, as I was saying, Oracle eBusiness Suite. It requires you to change the home directory of your Oracle installation, provide a specific SID, system ID. With custom, RDS custom for Oracle, you can make those adjustments. So it allows customers to lift and shift their existing applications that were built with the assumption of elevated access without making those changes while getting many of the benefits of a managed database service. And then there are situations because of which customers want granular control, uh, they have specific patches, or they're using a certain agent, or they want to use a certain driver for uh, their database, because now you have full access to the database instance. You can uh, essentially get control to all of this. The other situation is um, when you want to use specific features. There are times when customers have told us that they want to be able to use Configuration Manager with SSRS, SQL Server Reporting Services. Configuration Manager needs elevated permissions, so the only way to run it is if you run it on RDS Custom. Um, so what are the key launches in the RDS Custom space that we had for Oracle and SQL Server? First one is now we allow the customizations that are required for running Oracle eBusiness Suite on top of Oracle databases. Uh, we also support bring your own license for SQL Server, which is not an option on RDS SQL Server. RDS custom for SQL Server, bring your own license with your own media. That's a choice available to you. The other piece we changed with SQL Server on RDS custom is now we support point in time recovery with up to 1,000 databases on an instance. So you recall when I was talking about multi-tenant capability on Oracle, on SQL Server side, you can achieve something similar. It is by deploying multiple databases within a database instance. Previously, we used to support point-in-time recovery for up to 100 databases. Now, depending on your instance size with this launch, you can go up to 1,000 database, databases within a database instance and still get full point-in-time recovery capabilities with it. Uh, for availability, we have launched support for multi-AZ on SQL Server. I have a demo on this. I'll show you. It's quite neat. And finally, we added support for developer edition. Developer edition is something, again, you can download your own media and use it to run on RDS Custom for SQL Server.
So let's dive deeper into uh, these capabilities and how we are uh, seeing customers use them for more easily operating their databases. So first one is eBusiness Suite. As I said, eBusiness Suite requires you to have elevated database and operating system permissions. And one of the key pieces it requires you to do is to change the home directory location. In a managed service, if you do that, you'll of course not know where to go, right? But with custom, with the changes we have made, you can now specify the home directory that Oracle eBusiness Suite expects. And you can also change the SID on, a, again, a very specific format that eBusiness Suite requires. We do support multi-tenant architecture on RDS Custom for Oracle as well. So you can go with that, or you can go with a non-multi-tenant architecture too. On the application Apex configuration side, we support versions 12.1 and 12.2. Um, and if you are running eBusiness Suite on-premises, you are accustomed to our multi-tier application architecture. This diagram essentially shows you how you can replicate that on AWS. So you can have your eBusiness Suite running behind application load balancer to load balance across multiple uh, um, uh, eBusiness Suite application servers, and then connect uh, to the Oracle database, you can set up high availability. This is a single AZ setup in this representation, but for Oracle eBusiness Suite, usually it's a critical system, it's a CRM system. Customers want high availability, so we support automation for uh, Data Guard. Uh, you can also use Golden Gate if you prefer, and Rman backups is the other way we have seen customers use. Um, next up, which is something that our SQL Server customers were really delighted by, is the ability to use your existing licenses on RDS Custom for SQL Server. Um, the way it works is that you create a custom engine version. And a custom engine version is nothing but an Amazon EC2 image or AMI, machine image or AMI, with additional metadata telling us what it contains. That's all. So the way you would go about doing this is you would download your media on an EC2 instance, make the customizations that you want to make, then create an army out of that database instance, provide the Amazon resource name of that army to RDS, along with the version and the patch that you deployed on it. That creates what we call as CEV. It's a one-time process. Once you do this, you can reuse that CEV or custom engine version for multiple database instances, hundreds, thousands, we don't care. And once you have this database instance created, of course, you can you know, then launch as many instances as I was saying with RDS. So what are the custom engine version use cases? First thing is that your database configurations and customizations are persisted. Now remember, this is a, uh, a database running in your account in your own instance. There could be situations where the database instance becomes unhealthy. We monitor that and we replace it. But when we replace it, we wouldn't know what customizations you had. But guess what? With the CV you provided, now we know. So we'll use that CV to restore back your customizations and database where it was. And the other use case, of course, is that it gives you the ability to be consistent across a fleet of database instances. So you have the same customizations. Let's say you are deploying a monitoring agent and you want it across all your SQL Server databases. You can do that with a custom engine version. Um, some of the prerequisites for SQL Server specifically um, are go going to be that you want to make sure all the major versions and cumulative updates are applied before you create the CEV. Because once you create it, you'll have to again recreate it if you want to apply a new patch. You also want to grant uh, sysadmin access to the NT authority system login. Now this login is what is used by RDS automation to maintain visibility into your database instance and maintain high availability and so on, those capabilities. The third step, of course, that you want to ensure is that you run sysprep. This is required by Windows to ensure that any specific system-related information is not in the army that you are creating. Finally, you create the CV. As I said, you prepare it once, and then you can use it as many times as you want. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Um, moving on to the last feature under the manageability capabilities is the ability to do point-in-time recovery for up to 1,000 databases within a database instance. So previously, as I said, you had the ability to do point-in-time recovery for up to 100 databases. And for those who are not aware of RDS's point-in-time recovery capability, the way it works is that we take a daily snapshot, which is a full snapshot of your database. And if you have a multi-AZ deployment, we take the backup from the standby so that your primary doesn't suffer any performance degradation. But customers, of course, want to be able to recover to much more granularity than that. So for that, what we do is we capture the log streams on a five-minute granularity basis, so that gives you the ability to restore to five-minute intervals. In SQL Server, each of the databases have their own log streams. And with the optimizations that we have made now, we are able to capture log streams for up to 1,000 databases. So that's how it is working. And this gives you the ability, especially if you are a software as a service vendor, when you create a database per end customer, this gives you the ability to optimize how you're running your infrastructure, consolidate all of that in one database instance or fewer database instances, and also ease the manageability. You are no longer managing 1,000 database instances. You're managing one database instance running these many databases within it. Uh, moving on to availability, one key core tenet of RDS is that we offer simplified high availability capabilities. With custom initially, you had single AZ deployments. Now, with this launch, you have the ability to set up multi-AZ configurations. The replication is, uh, multi-AZ capability itself is fully managed. The replication is synchronous. So your standby is continuously getting the updates that the primary is making synchronously. So the RP or recovery point objective for you would be zero. There's no data loss when the failover happens. RDS monitors the availability of your primary database, and if something goes wrong, it automatically fails over to the standby. All of this is happening behind a DNS endpoint, so your application doesn't have to track which instance to connect to. Instead, it just talks to the DNS endpoint. When the failover happens, it will automatically start rerouting to the new primary instance. Uh, it's available uh, on SQL Server 2019 CU17 onward. Uh, some of the prerequisites that you would want to be mindful of, and again, this is specific to RDS Custom, doesn't apply to RDS SQL Server, is that you would want to open up port 1120. This is, again, required for our automation to maintain the synchronous copying of blocks between the primary and uh, the standby instance. You would also want to add an ACL update, as you see there. The other piece is our automation uses simple queuing service, SQS. And again, as I said, all the resources are in your VPC, in your account. So as a result, for us to be able to call SQS, you would have to create a VPC endpoint. Again, all the setup that I'm talking about has to be done once in one VPC. Once you do it, it applies to all the database instances that will be deployed there. And finally, grant permissions uh, to SQS for RDS to be able to talk to it. Uh, so just quick schematic, I also have a demo of how it's going to function with multi-AZ. So initially, your application is talking to the endpoint. Let's say the primary is in availability zone one. You're doing some writes. Those writes will synchronously get replicated to the standby in availability zone two. You can also do reads from the primary. The secondary is passive. You can't do reads or writes on that. Um, something goes wrong. We detect that. We switch the connection to availability zone two. That is where the standby was. We, um, restored, um, uh, we recover that database on the standby so that it can take full reads and writes. And that's it. That completes the failover. And then we'll set back up um, replication back to the old primary once you have a healthy database instance, primary instance, or we'll recreate one for you. So let's see this in action. Uh, this is never more fun than actually watching it and how it's going to play out. 
Right? So let's hop on over to the database RDS uh, console. I already have a database instance, multi-AZ database instance created. It takes some time to get it created, so therefore, set it up beforehand. As you see, it is a multi-AZ instance. And the primary AZ in this case is US East 2A. Now, this is a key thing to note here. I'll first connect to the endpoint for that database instance. This is the RDS side of the console, so it's going to show you only one instance. Underneath, though, there are two instances, and that's the first of. So I connect to that endpoint, run a query, gives me the result, nothing unique here, right? It's working. Let's hop on over to EC2. On EC2, now you would see that there are two instances, and you can find them by the name you specified. Of course, we also add the tags that do not delete this instance accidentally. But we can't still tell which one is the primary. But what we know is that it was in US East 2A. So that's the instance I pick. I take its private IP address. This is all private, not public. Uh, for databases, I don't know why someone would want to do that. Connect to it, the query works. Now I have picked the standby and tried to connect to it, and as you see, there's an error because that's passive. Next one, what I've done is I'm running a script which is continuously running this query and getting the results. So as long as the database is up and running, it will keep posting these results. But now we want to simulate a failure. And with custom, what we can go in and do is the primary instance, I'm actually going to stop it. Again, I'm simulating this. I do not recommend someone going into the EC2 console and doing this, but wanted to show how it works, right? So I stop that instance, stopping, and in a few moments, there you go. Now you start seeing errors because the primary is gone away. Uh, the neat thing here that's going to happen, unique things that's going to happen is RD is going to detect that. And as you see in the RDS events page, it has started, initiated a failover and it's actually completed. In a few minutes, in about, um, let's stop the script. In about one and a half minutes, that's how long it takes. Let's look at the timestamp. There you go, two minutes, 17 seconds. Um, that was the first failure. And then uh, let's scroll down. The first successful connection attempt was at two minutes, uh, 18 and 56. So uh, there you go, right? So about one and a half minutes is how long it took for the failover. Of course, we don't want to leave it in this state. RDS eventually would start it back up, but what we are going to do is start the instance back up. We stopped it. Takes a few minutes to do that, but let's hop on over to the RDS console. Let's see the events we are seeing. So one thing it is now notifying you of is that you did something bad. You did something outside of RDS's automation and stopped the instance. So it said that your instance is going out of parameter. Um, and once now, because I have already started the instance, we refresh it, the database instance becomes available. So that's multi-AZ in uh, action. In terms of choices, we have the developer edition now available to you. Um, it is intended for dev and test environments. Uh, you can download your own media, use the custom engine version route to get a developer edition on to RDS Custom for SQL Server. Includes all features of Enterprise Edition. So great for you know, building applications um, when you're kicking the tires. And as I said, available with your own media, own license. So what are some of the best practices for custom? So one thing we talked, touched upon is the support parameter. Support parameter is what determines whether RDS automation is able to maintain visibility into your database instance and manage your database instance or not. And if there ever is a customization that breaks the automation, you come to learn about it. Whenever you want to do certain actions which could break the customization, we allow you to change the automation mode on RDS Custom for SQL Server. You can stop the automation while you're making the changes so that RDS knows that you are intentionally breaking something. And then once you are done making the changes, you can turn the automation mode back on. And that will keep your database instance within support parameter and therefore continue to benefit from the manageability of RDS on it. Um, Again, unsupported configuration, I showed it in the demo as well. One thing you would want to do is subscribe to the events. I was showing you all the events. This way you would know that unintentionally, if you have broken the automation, 
for RDS. We'll come to know about it. And you can take action to fix that. In my case, of course, I started the instance backup. Um, there are a few step-by-step -step guides that you can refer, detailed steps on how you can set up RDS custom for Oracle and RDS custom for SQL Silver. And that's about it. That's all I wanted to cover today. I uh, hope uh, the, uh, this was a useful session for you. There are a bunch of questions I'm hearing. You know what? I'm going to get off stage, and then we can have a conversation. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll be off stage. I'll get unmiked, and then, then we can take all the questions. All right? Thank you all. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, do fill out the surveys. That's how we make sure the content is useful for you. All right, so let's do that. <laughs>